Hey there, let me ask you a question. Are you wondering how to raise more money for your deals? Like really raise money? You know, maybe you've raised some money before and you're looking for a way to scale. Because what you're looking for is how do you raise millions of dollars with very little effort in a few days? And, you know, that's what we're going to talk about here on this podcast. Maybe you don't even know anyone with money. I mean, you don't think you do. Or maybe you feel like you've tapped out your friends and family network and you can't figure out how to find more investors. You're probably thinking that it's not possible to do that, or if it is, it's a, it's a lot, a lot of work, yet so many people seem to be raising so much money in so little time. How do they do that? And that's exactly what we're going to talk about today on this podcast. We're going to have a very special guest, experienced investor and capital raiser Josh Cantwell, and we're going to show you what this looks like if done right. What does he do? How does he do it? And how does he... How is he able to raise $2.8 million in 60 minutes? And we use the same methodology at Nighthawk Equity. So that's what we're going to get into in this podcast. All right, let's do this. Well, hello and welcome to the show. I'm your host, Michael Blanc, and I'm super excited that you're here. Today's episode is sponsored by my free masterclass, and it's called How to Do Your First Apartment Building Deal. So if you have not done your first syndication yet, this free training might be for you because in it, I explain how you can get started with multifamily investing and do your first deal without your own cash and without any previous experience. So literally dozens of people who follow this blueprint that I show you on this webinar and have done their first deals and so can you. I'm really super excited to share this with you. You can get it at themichaelblank.com forward slash blueprint. That's themichaelblank.com forward slash blueprint. All right, and now on to our show. I kind of teased our special guest today is Josh Cantwell, who's been around for a very long time. He's a very established single-family house investor, wholesaler, flipper. He's got training classes. He's found a strategic real estate coach. You've probably come across him on Facebook and Instagram and social media. He's been in the online marketing world a long time, and he's leveraged that and combined it with the art of raising capital. In fact, today, he's almost focused exclusively on raising capital. He manages $38 million of private money. And what he does with that is he invests in multifamily units. He partners with experienced operators. operators. They actually originate loans uh, for life insurance companies and use crowdfunding platforms. He passively invests in himself and he really understands the power of marketing and capital raising. And that's exactly what we're going to explore today on the show, is putting the two together to be able to raise millions seemingly without effort. So we're going to kind of peel back the onions and layers in that, and let's get right in the show with Josh Cantwell. Here we go. Josh, welcome to the show today. Hey, Michael, what's going on? Thanks so much for having me on. I'm excited we could finally put this together. Yeah, it's been, a, it's been a while. We're so important people. It's, it took us a while to schedule this, but it's just so cool. And I just can't wait to get into your story a little bit because, my gosh, you have done so many things in your life. And I just want to kind of peel back the onions a little bit. But just get us started a little bit here. You know, who's, who's Josh, Josh Cantwell? What, sure. what, have, what have you done over the last few decades? Yeah, you know, I think the, the first thing that I'd like to sort of recognize is that I'm a family man. My entire business, my real estate business, my private equity business is all built around my wife, Lisa, and my three kids. I love to coach volleyball and basketball and football, and it's the most important thing to me. I once had a, a friend of mine, Michael, tell me that, you know, you think you have your kids until they're 18 or 21 or 25 or, you know, however old. He's like, you really only have them until they're 12. And I said, what, what do you mean, 12? He said, look, man, he's like, by the time they're 12, and then certainly when they're 16 and they get the keys to the car, oh, yeah. uh, they're going to want to spend a lot more time with their friends than they are with your parents. If, as cool as you are as a parent, no matter how much fun and fun, amazing things you do, they're going to want to spend time with their friends. So I took that literally. So over the last 10 years, I've uh, I focused on being a family man first and being an amazing husband and father and a businessman second, and I think it served me well. It served me with my clients and customers when I do real estate deals. They know that I'm authentic, and I, they know that what's important to me, and I think that resonates in what we do. 
Um, and also today we're focused primarily, we have, a, uh, we have a fund where we're a private lender. So we've funded over 400 private lender loans and hard money loans, primarily on residential property, fix and flip and fix and hold. Uh, but we're also an approved originator for a life insurance company and a very large couple uh, large crowdfunding platforms. So we originate first mortgage debt for both resi and commercial. We focus a lot in multifamily. Uh, we do a lot of small balance lending for multifamily. And finally, I love to invest uh, as a passive investor, sometimes as an active operator in multifamily properties. I own over 2,400 doors with joint venture partners. Um, and uh, it, it, I know what seat I like to sit in. So, you know, there's a lot of different places you can play in multifamily. Um, I don't have the experience in construction and operations like some guys. So I love to invest passively or even do the PG side of things or be a key person in a deal. But uh, I know where I like to play in multifamily and it's primarily on the passive side of things. So that's what we're up to right now. Yeah, that's fantastic. Now you had a, a health scare not too long ago. What, uh, what, what is that all about? I did. Yeah, Michael, thanks for asking. Matter of fact, uh, as we're recording today, it'll be in two days from today will be the eight year anniversary of my surgery that basically saved my life. Um, I was diagnosed in September, 2011 with advanced pancreatic cancer. Um, and anybody that knows anything about that disease, it's taken, you know, you know, right now, Alex Trebek, the host of Jeopardy is fighting pancreatic cancer. Luciano Pavarotti, um, many famous actors, uh, the guy who was famous for Dirty Dancing. What was his name? Um, Patrick was, Swayze? Patrick Swayze died from pancreatic cancer. I couldn't think of his name, but there's an only 8% survival rate. So I was very fortunate to have been diagnosed, but also had a surgeon that basically saved my life on the operating table. The cancer mass that I had, Michael, was as big as a basketball. It was advanced. It was 12 inches by 10 by 11. It was massive. Tons of back pain. Um, and I was forced to remove myself from my real estate business for almost nine months, about four months before the surgery and five months after the surgery, to prepare for the surgery and then also recover from the surgery. So I learned some massive business lessons from that. And, um, and I'm gonna be celebrating my, my eighth year cancer-free coming up in just two days. That is fantastic. Wow. What a, I can't imagine. I've not been through that. I've been through financial difficulties, but never health difficulties where your chance of coming out of it are basically very, very slim. I mean, what, how did that change you? Yeah. Well, it's, it's weird, Michael. Thank, thanks for asking. How does it change you? Because it does change you. Um, it's weird for me to even sit here today and think when I think about it coming up on this anniversary that, you know, 92 people that were diagnosed the same time I was diagnosed are gone. I'm one of eight, eight out of a hundred are still alive. And you know, when, when you're going through it, you don't know, like when you're in the middle of the muck and you're trying to figure out like, what do I do today to try to recover? What do I do today after this massive surgery to try to recover? I mean, they took my, my gallbladder, my spleen, they took my stomach. I don't have a stomach. You know, they connected my esophagus right to my small intestine. I had to relearn how to eat. I lost 50 pounds in three weeks all this happened and here, you know, to think about business, I had employees, a staff, I had a publishing company, coaching students, I had a real estate investment business, all back at the home office where I literally couldn't do anything. I couldn't call the office, I couldn't provide any insight, I could barely get out of bed. And so it changes you because you realize in that moment what you did right and what you did wrong, you know? Hiring the right people, I realized I did a lot of the right things because I had a staff and a team that was helping me to run the business while I was gone. But I also realized I was doing the wrong thing. It was very transactional. We owned a real estate brokerage. We were doing short sales. We were doing rehab flips. And if I wasn't there to kind of nudge things forward every day, things definitely, if they didn't break entirely, they definitely slowed down substantially. So my income dropped and I had to kind of, figure things out all over again. So it made me kind of reprioritize what was important to me. And that's why today I'm such a passionate family man, conservative family man. It's so important to me to be available for my wife and kids. But business-wise, it's forced me to also reconsider eight years ago of investing in things that are going to pay me in perpetuity, investing in private lender loans, investing in my fund, investing in multifamily that will allow me to pay the bills no matter if I'm there or not. And of course, if I'm not there, things might slow down a little bit, 
but there's not this massive drop off that happened in 2011 when I was in the hospital. Yeah. So you said that one of the things that was different about you was that you, t- you turned into a family man as the number one priority. Were you maybe not one before this uh, happened? Well, I would say I was always, you know, I, w- I grew up in a very conservative house. My father was an entrepreneur. He would work his face off from seven in the morning till seven at night. Um, but he was a very conservative person and, and he taught me and just watching him as an entrepreneur, I was a family man. But still, when I was at home, like I would be home at dinner and if my phone went off, I would be checking my phone. If I was home with my kids that were very young at the time, I always took it for granted that I would always be there for them. I could always maybe go downstairs and check my computer, go downstairs and check on a deal. If my wife was interested in talking, I'd be like, oh, hey, honey, hang on for a minute. Now it's always family first. I've built my life and my business around the opportunity to I do the same thing, Michael, every day. And I built it around my family. I take my kids to school every day. I drop them off at 730. So that time, that maybe 12 to 15 minutes with them in the car, I value that so much because that's when I, I hear about all the little stuff. What's going on at school? What happened with the test? What, which one of your classmates is acting weird? You know, who was maybe maybe bullying somebody. I hear about that little stuff in the car that I never hear about. Um, then I go take care of myself. Like I go right to the gym and I have from 7.30 to 8.20, 8.20 is my cutoff, an opportunity for me to be in the gym, work out, whether it's swim, whether it's exercise, whether it's lift heavy weights. Then I get a shower, it takes me 20 minutes at the gym and then I get right to the office at nine. And by then I've had family time. I've had time to take care of myself. I've had time to take care of myself mentally because I'm typically listening to a podcast, sometimes your podcast, sometimes others that are an audio book in the car. And I'm full of life by nine in the morning. So that when I get to the office, knock things out and typically I'm back home by about two o'clock. And so I can be home when my kids get home off the bus. And then I still work, work for my home office, but now I'm home to help my wife with things around the house or be there when my kids are home. And so Back then, I was less, I guess, purposeful about it. Now I'm very purposeful about my time. Yeah, that's so important. I mean, as entrepreneurs, the tendency or the, the is, is to simply work harder because we know if we work harder, we could do more. We can make more money. Right. right. And it's so difficult to guard against that. Uh, what do you do now when you get home, right? Because the same thing is still happening. Your phone's still going to ding at 6.30 or 8 yeah. o'clock. You know, well, how, how, what kind of systems have you been in place to, to counterbalance that? Or it, it, it's all about putting, putting gates around time, right? So uh, when, we, when we, we call them swim lanes, right? When I have certain time swim lanes or certain uh, job description swim lanes in my businesses for certain staff and myself, I know it needs to be accomplished. So what, one of the things I know for sure is when I get home around 2, 2.30 and I'm there with my kids, I know the house is going to be bustling, moving around. So I can't do things like strategically think. I can't do things like record a a big webinar or I can't do things like plan or strategize. That's the time for me when I can take calls with investors because calls with investors from really two o'clock to four 35 o'clock. That is just, I'm on the phone. I could be on the phone walking around my house on my cell phone. I can be getting a drink out of the refrigerator. I can check on my son. My wife needs to run out to a doctor's appointment or take my daughters to basketball or volleyball. I can still be there with my son and I could be on the phone. So I've structured my day that all my strategic thinking happens in the morning. All my important meetings happen in the morning. All my time and energy things that need a lot of insight, a lot of thought, a lot of planning in the morning and all my investor calls or looking at, like I can look at a deal at the kitchen table with my son doing his homework if I wanted to. I can talk to an investor with my kids, you know, eating a snack after school. I can't strategically think with all the family around. So I've learned to break up my day and know, and maybe it's because I'm 43, maybe it's because I'm a little bit older, maybe I don't have as much energy as I used to in the afternoon, but I know that all that strategic thinking has to happen in the morning, and then I can, it gives me energy to talk to investors, it gives me energy to look at deals. So to do that in the late afternoon, it counterbalances a time when, when, you know, biologically my body wants to slow down, but my energy is high because I'm doing things that give me energy, like talk to investors or look at deal flow. Yeah, I'm the same way. I'm more productive in the morning. So all my important work happens in the morning. And then the less important work, like answering emails or phone calls, for example, 
they happen in the afternoon because I tend to be yeah. less productive. And by 4.30, I'm like, done. You're like, okay, I've had enough, enough of this day. <laughs> right. So, you know, Michael, I, I read an awesome interview by, uh, with Dr. Oz, and I, I thought it was interesting. Dr. Oz, all of his adult career, took a nap every afternoon at 3 o'clock. And I, haven't, I have not been able to incorporate that, but on the days that I have actually done that, I've gotten a whole new set of energy in the second half of my day. So something I'm going to try to do in 2020 is to actually incorporate that more often. Interesting. That's a good tip. I, I do do a lunch every single day. So there's a, from 12 to one, I have lunch either with my wife or myself or, or somebody else. And it kind of breaks me up and re-energizes me. I have not done the nap thing though. On the weekends, I take naps, which is, it's a great day, Josh, when you can take a nap. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. Isn't it? What if you could take one every day? Dr. I, oh, that's an interesting so idea. In interesting idea. Uh, now, the other thing you said is that it, it, it had it, the, your, your health situation helped uh, force you to evaluate your business as well. Yeah. Now, you still have multiple businesses. Can you describe kind of what those businesses are and what the purpose or intent is behind them? Because you're alluding to the fact that uh, you didn't have businesses that were just more passive in nature, that were just paying mm -hmm. the bills. They were more active in nature. So can you talk about uh, the businesses you're in and kind of what your intent is behind them? Yeah, I think it really starts with that surgery, Michael. So I want to backtrack to that again real quick. So what happened was, is right before my surgery, I bought two properties and I knew I was going in for this massive surgery. I didn't even know if I'd make it through and I knew I wasn't really going to be able to work for probably a couple months. So what I did was I got everything in order. These were just, you know, residential flips, but I went out and raised about $200,000 of private money in literally two weeks before my surgery. I'll never forget on November 7th, I bought these properties and November 21st, I had my surgery. And for the next two or three months, I was not able to go visit the properties. I was barely able to talk to the contractors. And what I realized is by raising the capital and then having the construction draw money, which was managed by my CFO, I was able to control the deal by controlling the funding. Hmm. And I realized that I was able to do these couple of residential flips and do them with private money, true private money, not from an institutional private lender, but a true private lender, mom and pop. And we were able to keep the contractor on task because we controlled the funding. We were able to make sure the deal was on time and on budget because we controlled the money flow. And sure enough, when I went back to work in April of 2012, we sold these two properties and we made about $80,000 of profit. And I was like, okay, well, what if we could just do that again? And so I got fanatical about raising money because now I knew I could become a private lender. I could own assets, both cash flowing and flip properties, if I controlled the money. And so I got fanatical about it in 2012. In 2012, 13, and 14, we raised so much private money, we were able to fund all of our residential investments. And by 2014, I had so much extra like commitments and people who were interested that we started a private equity fund. And one of the ways we were able to create passive income is we grouped all these dollars into a fund structure and we became a private lender. Out of the fund, we would make private money and hard money loans. So these were loans for six months to a year, but of course people would pay the bills. Most of the time, there were some defaults, but most of the time, and it created regular recurring cash flow through the private lender mortgage payments. And we built up that fund to over $18 million. And we still make private money and hard money loans out of that fund. And I look forward to every quarter, we would get our management fees. And the management fees kept going up and up and up and up from managing this fund. And it became a several hundred thousand dollar a year passive income stream for me. And I was like, wow, that's, that's really amazing. And then because I was working with hundreds of investors and making these loans, People started asking me, Josh, we've had an amazing experience. Um, what else do you have? You know, you know we've got 100000 or 500000 or $250,000 in your fund. What else do you got? Uh, we don't want to just keep putting money in this fund, but what else do you have? And I knew a lot of my friends were investing in multifamily. And I, I started talking more about them. And, and, and a friend of mine came to me and he said, look, Josh, I've got this massive deal. I'm $1.2 million short of the funding that I need. Will you joint venture with me? Like, can I use your fund or do you have investor contacts? And can you come in and partner with me on this? Help me raise some money, partner with me on this deal. And we did, and we were able to raise $1.2 million. We invited some of our investors that were already in our fund onto the call. 
And uh, we presented this multifamily value add opportunity. And we literally raised $1.2 million in 60 minutes. Um, invest, inviting just a, a couple of people, about 12 people that I already had relationships with. And I thought, you know what, there's, there's definitely something here. And we set these deals up to syndicate these deals and raise capital. And for the last couple of years now, people have been coming to me, a lot of my close friends that are multifamily investors are saying, hey Josh, why don't you partner with us? You know, there's a couple of different places we could use your help, whether it's deal analysis, underwriting, uh, you know, raising capital, signing a PG, sponsoring a loan. Um, and so I got into multifamily almost by accident um, a couple of years ago. And so those are the businesses that we run today, all really streaming back to my surgery eight years ago. So that pivot happened. I fell in love with capital. And so today we're basically uh, a private money and hard money lender for residential uh, where we fund the acquisition funding and we broker the long-term permanent financing. So we do that on the resi side. And then on multifamily, we do the same thing. We provide acquisition capital and we do this through a crowdfunding platform. We basically broker bridge loans, if you will, for acquisition and stabilization for multifamily. And we provide the long-term financing for the permanent, you know, once the property is stable. And the last thing is we raise, you know, we get involved in deals as a JV and typically we're involved somewhere in raising capital for multifamily. We've got about $10 million of my own money and other people's money in multifamily deals. And so it's, it's kind of morphed over the last eight years. And so today we're spending probably 75% of our time in the multifamily space. So you've really turned uh, raising capital into essentially a business with multiple outlets. That's right. Raise the money, but then you deploy them. You have a, you have a fund, you have a hard money lending, you have the, you have the brokerage business, uh, mortgage brokerage business. Then you also raise capital for multifamily and then you also passively invest. That's correct. Right. That's now, exactly right. And we've now, because of our reputation of being a capital provider, we've gone out and some people have sought us out. Sometimes we've sought other people out. Yeah. And again, we've, we've created these relationships with crowdfunding platforms where they want us to find deal flow. They want us to originate, you know, acquisition loans, bridge, bridge loans, and permanent finance loans and sell them off. So, you know, it all started with that original $200,000 raise eight years ago uh, to today. You know, our plans for 2020 is we're going to originate over at least a quarter of a billion dollars uh, of multifamily loans and sell those off to a life insurance company and crowdfunding platforms that, that do uh, first mortgage uh, debt. Um, and, you know, and we're excited to be a passive investor to create long-term cash flow for ourselves. Yeah, so that's very interesting. Now, you, that first 200,000 or 250 you raised, you were doing uh, flips and things of that nature before then. Now, why had you not raised money before this? And mm -hmm. what were some of your maybe limiting beliefs around that, why you didn't do it or why you waited that long and tell me about that back before the light bulb maybe went off. Sure. You know, it's interesting, Michael, I think self-limiting beliefs are a huge part of what make us who we are. You know, in, in 2008, 9, 10, 11, I was doing a lot of short sales, a lot of transactional work during the, during the crash. Uh, we were making big checks, doing back-to-back -back short sale flips and wholesaling. And even though we did massive events, you know, 150, 200, 300, 350 attendees. We had big keynote speakers. I can tell you that I had a self-limiting belief that I wasn't educated enough. I wasn't smart enough. I wasn't knowledgeable enough about multifamily or I wasn't educated enough or, or smart enough or, you know, uh, to, 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 to raise capital. It was really my surgery that forced me. And oftentimes that's what we find. There's some life experience, some life event that forces us to change, right? It's often when we're in our comfort zone, like I was comfortable in 2008, 2009, 10, doing a lot of short sales. And I knew it was transactional work, but it was what I knew. And what I think that's the enemy of progress, the enemy of growth is doing something that we know that provides us a certain amount of comfort, even though we know we're, we can be bigger, we can be better. There's another version of ourselves that can do more. We don't reach for it because we're comfortable just doing what we're doing today. And I think that's something with multifamily investing or raising capital, you've got to break the routine. You got to break the habit by trying something new, doing something new, and then being successful with it. 
in order to grow and then achieve the next, the next thing. So for me, it was about that surgery for me was a huge inflection point, a huge pivot point because it forced me to get out of my comfort zone. I had to, because I knew I didn't want to go back to being a transactional investor anymore. And so I just jumped into it. I started talking to friends. I started talking to family. And again, this goes back to our conversation that we had before about if, if you have something that you feel so compelled that it's going to help someone else, you have, I feel like you have a moral obligation to sell it to them or present it to them, present the opportunity. It's going to help them and help their life. And so I knew that when I was doing flips and, and, and pulling people into my deals, I was paying them 12% interest or 15% of my profits, whichever was greater. And we were successful at doing that over and over and over again. And I knew this was helping a lot of people that the stock market couldn't provide for them. And so I got so passionate for it. I could talk to anybody about 12% interest or 15% of our profits. And I knew we were going to protect their money. And then it just morphed into the fund. Then it morphed into multifamily. But it was about the conviction that I knew we could do better for them than they could otherwise do for themselves or what the stock market could do for them. Now, before you were, I would say, kind of a very active investor means you were doing flips and wholesales, which means you were sourcing deals or through your network sourcing deals. Now, you then pivoted a little bit to raising more capital instead of sourcing multifamily deals. Why did you gravitate and more towards almost exclusively towards the capital raising end of that spectrum? Yeah, I think it was a comfort zone. I think, again, you go back to self-limiting beliefs or what are we comfortable with? I knew that I was really good at nobody ever told me when I presented a private lending opportunity or when I presented a deal, whether it was my deal or someone else's deal that I was joint venturing on, nobody ever told me at the end of like a presentation, Hey Josh, that's a super dumb idea. <laughs> nobody ever said like what you presented me was awful and I would never do that. I always got positive feedback. So I knew I was training my brain and training my body to think like, I can do this. I can raise more capital. I can, I can get involved in more deals. And I knew, I kept telling myself, funding equals freedom. If you want to get freedom, you need to own assets. And the way you own assets is by having access to funding. And so with, whether it was my funding or someone else's money, you just need access to all kinds of funding to buy assets. And assets create cash flow. And so I knew funding, funding, funding. And when I didn't have a ton of experience in multifamily a couple years ago, I thought, well, the best thing for me to do is joint venture with people that already have experience or people that really know how to operate, guys who are really good boots on the ground, guys that know how to evaluate deals. Let me leverage their experience and let me leverage what seat they're sitting in in the multifamily world and let me participate doing what I do best and let them do what they do best and let's joint venture. Now, as we've gotten more experience in multifamily, we've got more experience in raising capital, we're doing more and more and more of our own deals, or we're sitting in the operations seat. But it naturally started with us in the capital side of things because of my background and what I had done after my surgery. Now, uh, how, let me ask you, when you, as you first, when you first started off raising money, and it was like, like for me and maybe for you, you're, you're raising money, you know, one-on-one -on -one with people, you raise a couple hundred grand. What now has changed? How are things different now where you can raise $1 million, $2.8 million in just a matter of, of hours or days? Yeah. What's, what's the, how is that possible? Yeah, Michael, I think it comes down to this. Like, when I meet with a new potential investor, I use the Securities Exchange Commission to my advantage. I use the, the 506B. So if people are familiar with Reg D, 506B, a lot of your audience is very familiar with those, 506C. I tell everybody when I meet with them for the first time, look, um, the Securities Exchange Commission requires that we have a prior existing relationship, a prior substantial relationship before you invest with me. So it doesn't matter if I have a Reg D or uh, 506B or 506C, I, I use that to my advantage by telling them, look, I wanna get to know you, I wanna ask you questions. So I've taught now my whole team in my office, I've got four of us that know this line of questioning and know this process. When we meet with a new potential investor, that we make it all about them. We have a series of 10, 12 questions that we ask them, and we tell them, look, the SEC requires that we have this relationship with you. So I need to ask you whether you're accredited or not, what kind of experience you have, what assets you've invested in before, so what, what, uh, 
you know, what your risk tolerance is. So we go through that, we ask all these questions and we say, look, once we have enough information about you, then we can present a deal. So my team, if you will, always has this pot of investors, if you will, and they're always on sort of a simmer. Like, you know, think about your oven and it's always on like the two or the one and just simmering. And so we're warming people up. Then when we have an investment opportunity, whether it's our fund or whether it's a multifamily deal, then we start to turn up the heat and it goes from a two to a 10 or it goes from two to high. And all of a sudden what we do is now we have relationships with these people. We've, we, we can check the box that the SEC requires that we have this relationship. Now what we'll do is about a week in advance, I'll plan a webinar to this group of investors and I'll say, look, we're going to open up an opportunity in this multifamily deal. We need to raise $3 million of, of private investor capital. We've already raised a million because typically we have some early commitments or some repeat investors that have already grabbed a unit or grabbed a spot. And I'll say, look, we're going to open up 20 spots. And that's all we have available, these 20 spots. I'm going to host this webinar and I'm going to take you through the opportunity. And so, and I'll send a, a series of about three or four emails. We always hold this webinar on a Tuesday. It's always Tuesday at one o'clock Eastern time. So we can do it during the launch hour and we always do it early in the week so that we can follow up with investors throughout the week, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. And we basically tell them, look, on the call, we anticipate we're gonna be inviting X number of people. So however many people are on our list, let's say it's a thousand people, or let's say it's 40 people, however, however big your list is, we're gonna be inviting this many people and we're gonna open up however many spots, let's say it's 10 spots or 20 spots, so it's the law of scarcity. We're gonna open up this many spots and come on to the webinar to learn more. So when they get on the webinar, I jump on right away and I tell them, hey, I'm gonna present you an investment opportunity. We already have an existing relationship with you. We can check that off. So I can make you an investment uh, option today and basically make you an offer today. And when we do that, we tell them, hey, this is going to look and feel and smell just like the deals that I told you about during our discovery interviews. So after I get to know them during the discovery interviews, find out about them, then I'll tell them, hey, the deals that we do for apartments generally look like this. You know, there's a preferred return, or there's cash out refi proceeds, or there's equity in perpetuity, or there's cash flow in perpetuity. I'll frame up during the discovery what a deal potentially could look like. And then when we have a real deal that makes sense that we're joint venturing on or partnering on, I bring it to them, it's exactly like what we've warmed them up with. Now when they jump on the call, they're like, that's exactly what Josh said it would be, but oh crap, he invited a thousand people or 400 people to this webinar, and there's only, let's say, 12 spots available or 15 spots available. So when the webinar begins, I'm gonna tell them, listen, we're gonna open up 15 spots. Here's my cell phone number. The first 15 people that text me during this live webinar are gonna be able to reserve a unit. So what's happened to us is over the last several times we've gone to raise capital, we've used this process again and again, and I'll have 28 commitments, let's say, the last time I did this, 28 commitments, and I only needed to raise $1.2 million. So $2.8 million in commitments in 60 minutes on a $1.2 million raise. The time before that, we needed to raise a million dollars, we had 1.7 million. The time before that, I was actually working in joint venturing with Jack Petrick, who was one of your students, one of my friends, and Jack and I did a deal together. I committed that we would work together to raise 2.2 million. I told Jack we need to raise another 1.1. I had $3 million in commitments on a $1.1 million raise. And the reason why is because we create sort of an irresistible offer. We work with these investors, we talk with them, we find out what's important to them, then we frame up a sort of dummy deal, if you will, or an example deal. And we tell them, hey, once we have a deal that meets this criteria, I'm gonna invite you to the webinar. And when they get invited, they're like, boom, it's ready. Boom, here it comes. And in between the discovery and the webinar, I'll tell people, hey, we got a deal in our pipeline that's coming maybe in 30 days or 45 days from now, make sure you stay liquid. Then about maybe two weeks to three weeks out, I'll tell them, hey, I think this deal is gonna work its way through the pipeline. We're gonna host a webinar. We're probably gonna get a lot of people on the webinar, but make sure you stay liquid. So I'm constantly kind of priming them, kind of taking that 
you know, pot of sauce on the oven, if you will, turning it up a little bit, a little bit till we get to the point of the webinar and then bang, we're on high. And we typically over raise at that time because everyone's so excited to finally have an opportunity to invest in. Yeah, so if you've, you've basically built this online platform where you're attracting investors, you're nurturing them, getting them to the point where they can uh, are ready to raise money. And then at that point, uh, um, they, you actually present them with an opportunity. What do you do in the meantime when they're on, on simmer? What do you do in the simmer mode? Yeah. So let me back up, Michael, because I think it starts with you've got to have sort of an irresistible offer. You've got to have a model of investing in multifamily, or it could be even single family or a fund or whatever your model is. But the model has to be, I think step number one in this process really begins with, we've learned to create an irresistible, we call it a devastatingly logical, irresistible offer, right? It's, it's just so like, oh my God, that makes so much sense. So, and it starts with, again, that first deal I did during my surgery, when I told people, we we're going to pay them 12% interest or 15% of the profit, whichever was greater. That was an irresistible offer. So it starts with that. So if you're doing a multifamily deal, maybe it's a preferred return plus equity or a preferred return plus cash out refi proceeds plus equity. Whatever that is, you start with an irresistible offer. People that just say like, wow, that's an amazing opportunity. Nobody ever says that's a dumb idea, right? It starts with that. Then the second thing is, and I have this in kind of in a five-step process, but the second step is I don't look to raise money from everyone. I think if you go into multifamily, people think like, well, I can start with friends and family, and that's a logical first step, and my associates. But when you're in this game for a while, you really want to kind of narrow down. And, and, and one of the analogies, Michael, that I like to give is I have a buddy of mine, his name is Jake, and he's a commercial insurance salesperson. Now, when Jake was a generalist, he struggled. When he niched down and said, I'm only going to sell commercial insurance to assisted living facilities and uh, nursing homes and people in the adult care world, his business blew up because he was known as the guy who to go to if you needed commercial insurance um, in the assisted living world. So very similar in the raising money world. If, if you are an expert at raising money from engineers or you're an expert at working with doctors or you're an expert at working with guys with e-com businesses, you really want to go and network and spend time in that niche over and over and over and over. So if you're going to raise money from doctors, go to all the doctor functions, go to country clubs. If you're going to raise money from e-com guys that own e-com businesses, which is one of my avatars, I go to all the e-com events. Because guys are saying, hey, that's Josh. If you want to learn anything about real estate, he's the guy in our e-com world who knows the most about real estate. So that's step number two is really identify who's your avatar that you want to raise money from, right? One of my other avatars is people who are lifelong, you know, Fortune 500 lifers who are now retiring. So I work with a lot of CPAs and accountants and attorneys who work with clients who are doing regular tax returns. And I say, look, you know, if you've got guys that are on the brink of retiring and are looking for passive income, let me know. I'd love to talk to them about these real estate things. So a couple different avatars. Then you got to think, step number three, Michael, is where can these people be found? Like you have to be more strategic about raising money, about where you're going to go and where you're going to spend your time. You can't just go to every networking function. You can't go to every meetup. You can't go to every you know, e-com event or RIA club meeting or you know, a chamber of commerce. You got to be strategic about where you go. Where can these people be found, right? So in the last eight years, we've gotten really, really, really good at raising money because, look, I, I want to go places where the, the, the accredited investors are hanging out. I want to go places where those e-com uh, business owners are hanging out and, and be an expert in, in, in that place. And so when I meet them and talk with them, they're like, oh, wow, you're already working with these other e-com guys. You're already working with these, you know, uh, people who've retired. You're working with retirees. Um, and so I have a sort of sense of credibility already. And then once I do the discovery meeting with them, I tell them it's all about them. I've got to get to know them first. The SEC requires it. Then what we do during that simmer stage where we don't maybe have a deal, we send out three pieces of content a week. 
Uh, we do it on Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. We're super recurring about it, strategic about it. Um, every single Tuesday, we send out what we call a funding opportunity. A funding opportunity is either a deal that we have that's coming or a deal that we've previously funded that is just a deal for them to look at, whether it's a multifamily deal, maybe a residential deal in our fund, um, or a deal that maybe we deal we didn't do that we just wanna educate them on. So every single week, once a week, we send them a funding opportunity, and that showcases some sort of deal, just so we can be the top of mind reference in their mind. Now, um, because we're also funding deals with debt, we also send out once a week, we send out a different uh, type of product that we can fund if they're looking for debt financing. So a lot of people maybe don't do that, that's part of our business, but not somebody else's business. And the third thing we send out is just something that's personal for me. It could be a blog post, could be a Facebook Live, could be a YouTube video. Anything, we send those on Saturdays because people like to, on the weekends, not have anything salesy really. Um, but on the weekends, have something that they can just easily consume and digest, something five minutes or less. Um, and on Saturday, if they get it, they'll typically clean out their inbox on Sunday nights or Monday mornings. And then I'm, again, back in front of them uh, with some piece of content about finding deals, finding money, something motivational, maybe an event that I was at, maybe just uh, a quote that I heard from somebody that was impactful, uh, something that's not very, you know, um, not very intrusive or, or I'm not asking them for anything. I just want to get them something from me on the weekend. And that's what we do. So I have a whole team now that's helping me pull that off. Uh, I would say if somebody's doing something new and they're doing it for the first time, just get something out once a week, some email, some piece of content, some deal once a week, email it out to their list so that their list knows, hey, if I got a, a question about real estate, I want to go talk to Josh. I want to go talk to Michael. I want to talk to that person. Um, if I've got a question about raising money or getting invested in a deal or multifamily, single family, whatever it is, you've got to stay in touch with people because the world is so spaced out right now. There's so many shiny objects. You've got to stay in front of people on a regular basis. So kind of a long winded answer, but I, I think I answered that for you. Well, I think, I think it's great because now you come from an e-commerce background. Uh, you've done a lot of stuff online. Certainly by, if you're a wholesaler, you're taught, oh, marketing is a, is a key piece of the, of the puzzle. You know, bandit mm -hmm. signs, SEO, websites, all that stuff. Interestingly, in the multifamily world, no one has a clue about any of that stuff because that's we true. think that we're in the real estate investing business, which we are. And in the beginning, that's fine because you're, you're raising money from friends and family and you're networking and that's great. There are people who have raised 250, 500,000, even a million dollars and they go, my gosh, I'm tapping out my network. And their biggest mm -hmm. problem is how do I expand my network? And at that point, sure. now we're talking about what you're talking about. We're basically building an online platform. Right, we're all, we're moving our business online. We know now the mechanics of raising money. We just have to scale it. And so, right. my call to action to everyone listening and watching this is: if you want to scale your business, uh, your syndication business, your capital raising business, you have to start thinking about building an online thought leadership platform. And you kind of outlined some of the steps. You need a way to to get them uh, to capture the lead. You need to get a way to nurture them to get them to create that substance relationship, get them deal ready. And then when you actually have a deal, you gotta, you gotta sell, you gotta sell, sell, sell. That's right. And then in doing so you can raise millions of dollars in just a matter of days. And that's the power of the online medium that we're, that we're at. So and that's the power, honestly, Michael, of just purely Facebook. You know, if you look at Facebook and Facebook lives, your Facebook feed is essentially your personal blog. And if people find you interesting, you know, so many people just talk about their family. That's great. Talk about your family, your wife, your kids, you know, your partner, whatever, whatever you got going on there. Fantastic. But when you close a deal, you know, you've got to talk about that, you know, talk about, because again, the SEC requirement is you can't just go on Facebook and throw up about an offer and make an offer. Unless you have a 506 C, um, a reg D offering, you can do that with a 506 C, but Nobody really even cares. Like, even if you have the most amazing offer ever and you can solicit your Facebook audience, none of them are going to pay attention unless they have a relationship with you, even if it's an online relationship. So the best way to do it is to talk about deals, to share some of it. I find the posts that I share that where I am experiencing a huge challenge, whether it's in business or personal, that's the, those are the posts that I get the most likes that get the most engagement. 
So don't just talk about, hey, I've got this awesome deal and we made another $50,000 profit. I bought another multifamily deal and we're making $100,000 in passive income or $500,000 passive. Don't talk about just that. Talk about the challenges, the hard times in the past, the things you've gotten through, the, the, when you were totally in the muck. That's what people like to pay attention to. What people love is the superhero, the hero's journey when that came out of the depths of problems and challenges and faults and things they did wrong, then they're all of a sudden successful. People hate people who brag, but what they love is the hero's journey for somebody who was down here who's now made it or starting to make it through. People will engage with you, and when they engage with you, then they're going to start to direct message you. If then when they start to direct message you, take that conversation offline and you build a relationship with somebody, now you can start to talk about joint ventures and raising capital. That's how it's done, and it can be done just through Facebook and Facebook Lives. It's an amazing tool. It really is. It's, it's, it has never been easier to reach people, uh, cold audiences, and making them warm and warm and warm. Now, what's your kind of your parting advice to capital raisers who've maybe raised some money or, or really want to scale their business and they really haven't thought about the idea of building an online platform. Like what, what should they be thinking about? What should be, that you'll be doing in the next year or so? I think the first thing they've got to think about is when you decide to take money from passive investors, you have to understand that you've immediately put yourself in second position. When it's the mindset of if you're going to raise money and take people's money into your business, into your deal, you now, your number one objective is to grow and protect that passive investor's money. So, you know, just because you have their money in your account or in a deal, it's not an ATM for you to just go buy whatever you want, do whatever you want. It is you have to protect that money. And typically, the private placement memorandum, the offering memorandum is going to talk about how you're going to use those proceeds. It's called use of proceeds. So how you're going to use their dollars in that deal. So that's the first one is mindset, knowing that you now are second fiddle. Your most important asset is your private lender. You got to take care of them. Secondly, raising money in my world is not a forever business. It's not a forever business. If you build up, if you make the commitment to raise money over the next one to three years and you raise your first million or your first $5 million, that money, if you do a good job with it, it's never going to leave you. It's never going to leave you. People will come back to you. They're going to refer their friends and family, but they're going to reinvest with you. Every time they get their principal back, they're going to reinvest in your deals. So you don't need an infinite amount of money. You don't have to raise a billion dollars or a hundred million dollars. You don't even have to raise 10 million. You can do a lot of damage in the multifamily space. If you just raise a million or two or 5 million bucks. So know that it's a commitment, but it's a commitment with a certain start and end time. Like I'm at the point now I raise almost, I manage almost 35, 40 million bucks. I really don't need to raise any money next year in 2020. All I need to do is go find deals. Um, and so no, it's, it's, it, it, it's a sacrifice. It's an objective. It's a strategy for a finite period of time. Because once you work with those investors and kind of control that relationship, you're going to have access to that money if you do a good job forever. So that's the second thing. Again, my, my, my mindset says, I just have to do this for a year or two or three. And then once I've raised the money, I'm good. The third piece of it is investors are going to, they're, they're going to jump. They're going to leave you if you ignore them. So you've got to have some regular way to stay in touch. Email marketing, just sending out regular recurring emails. You can send it right out of your Outlook account or your Gmail account. It doesn't have to be anything uh, you know, crazy. Doing a Facebook post or Facebook Live once a week. Um, our, our rule of thumb is for every one post about business, we want to have seven to ten posts that are more personal in nature, um, that are not asking them for money or not talking necessarily about business. Because people hate people, people are just always talking about business or always bragging. Um, and the, the, the final thing is number four is it's all about follow up. And I'll, I'll, I'll kind of finish up with this story. I met an investor in 2015. I was referred, his name is Brandon. I was referred to Brandon by my friend, Sean. I grew up with Sean. I've known him since second grade. A couple of years ago, 2015, Sean refers me to Brandon. We go down to Brandon's house. He lives in Charlotte, North Carolina. We go golfing on Trump National Golf Course before Trump was president. And Brandon and I just start talking. I didn't go down there to raise money. We went down there to play golf. And we start talking a little bit about 
my deals and I tell them a little bit about multifamily. I tell them a little bit about the 12% interest or 15% of the profit or fund. Two years goes by, but once a quarter, I was sending Brandon a, a, a physical newsletter. Once a month, I would just be like, hey, Brandon, just checking in, man. What's going on? How are your investments doing? Uh, hey, man, let's hop on a call. I got a deal uh, that we're, we're, we're looking at closing. I don't need any money for it. This is the, one of the best things you can do. Have a deal that you've already subscribed. Have a deal that's already sold out and say, look, I want to walk you through this deal, but it's not available for you to invest in. That's one of the most powerful things you can do as a capital raiser is to show them a deal that other people did that they are boxed out of. So I showed Brandon deals that he was boxed out of. And then by 2017, Brandon and I were talking on a regular basis, decided to make his first investment. And it was at that time, it was a, it was a fix and flip rehab. Then he got into our fund. Then he referred me to his mom. That now he's invested with us about seven or $800,000 in our fund and in multifamily deals. One, because I, I told Brandon, Brandon, I could use your money, but I don't need it. One of the most powerful things you can say is, I could use your money, but I don't need it. Even if you need it, even if you need it badly for a deal, tell people, I could use your money, but I don't need it. And to continue to send people deals that you've closed or deals that maybe you passed on and educating them about deals without asking them for money, they're going to come to you eventually and say, hey, Josh, I'm liquid now. Like, I've seen your deals. I'd really like to talk to you about investing. And they'll, they'll, they'll come in. So uh, having that follow-up is very, very important because no today is typically because the deal wasn't right or the timing wasn't right. If you've worked on the relationship building, it's more about the deal or the timing, it's not about you. So if you stay in touch with them, the deal's gonna be right and the timing will be right and then they're gonna come into a deal. That's what Brandon did. And lastly, people will test you with a small investment. They might test you with 50,000 or $100,000 knowing that they've got millions to invest. You know, I've got a guy now, his name is Dinesh and Dinesh is, a, is an e-com, he's a multi, multi-billionaire from Dubai. He doesn't mind if I mention his name. He started with $100,000 with us, and Dinesh is a multi, multi, multi millionaire, but he started small. And if you do well by them, they're gonna invest more. So you gotta take the long term approach. Give them a bite at the apple, give them an opportunity, do well by them, and they're gonna invest more over time. So good. Josh, how can people connect with you? Uh, yeah, just go to our website, strategicrealestatecoach.com. We've got a ton of free tools there. Um, also, my book, uh, it's called The Flip System. This book is actually the book that I wrote about my journey through pancreatic cancer, investing in real estate, and raising money. Uh, so if you're going through a tough time, going through a challenge, you're looking for some inspiration, and you're looking for more tips on how to raise capital, check it out. You can get it at uh, it's www.getflipsystem.com. So those are our two websites. Look me up on Facebook. Um, that's another great way. And uh, thanks so much, uh, Michael, for uh, you know just having me on and. Uh, introducing myself to your audience. It's been a lot of fun. It has been a lot of fun. I really enjoyed getting to know you uh, a little bit more through this podcast and when you interviewed me. So real, real pleasure and honor to get to know you better. So thanks for coming on the show. You bet. You bet. I can't wait to uh, come to your event coming up this summer. Dealmakers event. It's going to be awesome. We'll be there and I look forward to building our relationship. And uh, thanks so much for having me on, Michael. Really appreciate it. All right. If you want to raise money, I mean, really raise money, you got to start thinking about building an online thought leadership platform. Now, it doesn't start that way, okay? You start raising money one at a time, and we teach this in all of our, our courses, is how do you find that investor? What do you say to them? How do you use a sample deal package? How do you conduct your first meeting? And this is super critical if you haven't raised any money before because there are certain things you have to figure out first. You have to figure out, well, who is your investor? What do they want? What are they afraid of? How do you structure the deals, right? You have to know all these things. And the best way to, to do that is simply by raising money one person at a time. And you can raise 500000 a million dollars in this way. Uh, and at one point, there will come a point where you are going to exhaust your network and your networking ability is going to be limited. And you start scratching your head asking yourself, well, how do I attract more investors? And I'm not talking about one investor, but I'm talking about 10, 20, 100 investors. How is it that Nighthawk can raise 20 to $30 million a year? How is it that other people can raise that amount of money? And the answer is a platform. Okay, so you got to start thinking about online marketing techniques. And something I'm going to start talking a lot more and increasingly more about uh, throughout 
the year now because it's something that is super important and and very very well um, and not understood very well because really we're getting into the realm of online marketing which has nothing really to do with real estate or capital raising it's a completely different ball game to me it's very exciting because there's a it's a whole new different business that I have to learn. I read a completely set of new of books. I listen to a completely set of, of, of podcasts that have nothing to do with real estate investing, and I find it fascinating. On the other hand, it it scares a lot of real estate investors and capital raisers, and this is kind of what I want to address in the next 12 months or so by putting out more material around what it entails to create an online thought leadership platform. What are the elements of the platform? What sequence of the platform should you build? So if you're interested in that, I actually have a a, a, a training a webinar I'm doing. It's an on-demand training, and you can get it at themichaelblank.com forward slash platform. And that's still kind of early on, but the, that URL I'm going to use over time to kind of put together a resources page to help you to help you figure out how to put a platform together. But right now, that webinar you're going to see at that at that URL is going to teach you how you can raise millions by building a platform and building your email list specifically. And I kind of break this down in the way I just described. So it's themichaelblank.com forward slash platform. It's on-demand training. You just got to register for it. And as soon as you're in, you can watch a training at your leisure whenever you want. I think it's going to blow your mind. I've given this presentation live a few times, and I've gotten an amazing response and feedback from that. So check it out, themichaelblank.com forward slash platform if you're interested in building a platform. Um, if you are just starting out raising capital, the next best step is to download my free ebook called How to Raise Money to Buy Your First Apartment Building Deal. And that's at themichaelblank.com forward slash ebook. Uh, we just put out a new version of that. So it's a little bit newer, a little fresher, has some new insights in there. It's themichaelblank.com forward slash ebook. And if you're interested in investing with us, with Nighthawk, if you're interested in passive investing with us, then why don't you join our investor club? You can do that at Nighthawk Equity. Dot com and click the join button and uh, you'll fill out a very, very short form and schedule a call with us so we can get to know each other and then we can present you with upcoming investor opportunities. That's it for today. Appreciate you guys being on the show. Catch you next time. All right. I hope you enjoyed that. Now, as the next step, download this ebook right here. Okay. When you've downloaded that, uh, make sure you also subscribe to my YouTube channel because then you can get all of the videos that I release as soon as I release. So make sure you subscribe to the YouTube channel right now. Click on that right now. And then also make sure that this is the next best video to watch is this one right here. So hope you enjoy that. I'll catch you next time.